Some poems force you to write them. The way sirens force their way through window panes in the night, and you can't shut out the news, even when you try. Write a humanizing poem. My pen and paper goad me. Show them how wrong their preconceptions are. Be relatable. Write something upbeat for a change. Crack a smile. Tell them how you also cry at the end of Toy Story 3. And you're just as capable of bantering about the weather in the post office queue. Like everyone, you have no idea how to cook the perfect amount of pasta still. <laughs> Feed them stories of stoic humor. Make a reference to childhood. Tell an anecdote about being frugal, mention the X factor. Be domestic, successful, add layers, tell them you know brown boys who cry. About the sides of Assad's, Amir's, and Hassan's they don't know. The complex inner worlds of Samayas and Aisha's. Tell them comedies as well as tragedies. How full of life we are, how full of love. But no, I put my pen down. I will not let that poem force me to write it because it is not the poem I want to write. It's the poem I have been reduced to. Reduced to proving my life is human because it is relatable. Valuable because it is recognizable. But good GCSEs, family and childhood memories are not the only things that count as a life. Living is. So this will not be a Muslims are like us poem. I refuse to be respectable. Instead, lovers when we're lazy, lovers when we're poor, lovers in our back-to-backs, council estates, depressed, unwashed and weeping, lovers high as kites, unemployed, joyriding, time-wasting, failing at school, lovers filthy, without the right colour passports, without the right sounding English, lovers silent, unapologising, shopping in Poundland, skiving off school, homeless, unsure, sometimes violent, lovers when we aren't athletes, when we don't bake cakes, when we don't offer our homes or free taxi rides after the event, when we're wretched, suicidal, naked and contributing nothing. Love us then. Because if you need me to prove my humanity, I'm not the one that's not human. My mother texts me too after BBC News alerts. Are you safe? Let me know you're home okay. And she means safe from the incident, yes but also from the after effects. So sometimes I wonder, which days of the week might I count as liberal, and which moments of forehead to the ground am I conservative? I wonder, when you buy bombs, is there a clear difference between the deadly ones that kill and the heroic ones which scatter democracy? I wonder, isn't it really guilty until proven innocent? How can we kill in the name of saving lives? How can we illegally detain in the name of maintaining the law? I can't write it. I put my pen away. I can't, I won't write it. Is this radical? Am I radical? Because there is nowhere else left to exist now. Thank you so much. So uh, this next poem is, um, I tried to write a poem. I spent some time with my nanny, that's my grandma, and my masi, that's my auntie, in uh, Pakistan. And I thought, ah, oh, I'm going to write a poem about this, this is great, this is nice. Found it really hard, really hard to write a poem about them. And it's because the images that kept coming to my mind <clears throat> were not my images. And I think it's such a trap, with, you know, when our minds have been colonized, when our images of ourselves have been colonized. Um, and so I ended up writing this attempt at writing a poem, which, as you might see, is a theme. It's a bit of a cop-out that I do with my poetry. Yeah. I do not know how to write us outside of bangles and anklets. Gold and pretty, but still a type of chain. I do not know how to write us outside of romance and tragedy. Tears of grief or tears of joy, which for us too often are made the same. I do not know how to write us outside of long hair and long eyelashes, which apparently suit us better than long lives. I do not know how to write us outside of fear, yet. Whispers and elisions and repeated mistakes. I wonder if our mothers promised they would not do the same. I do not know how to write us outside of our mothers. How not to make reference to their spines and silences. How to do it as more than a prelude to my own. I do not know how to write us outside of men. 
their eyes, their words, their grips, their pleasure. I do not know how to see our bodies outside their hands, how to salvage our skin from their requirements, how to write us with hairy arms and upper lips, bushy eyebrows before they were fashionable, cracked heels, full bellies and laughing mouths, not just kissing lips. I want to know how to write us outside the kitchen. Too often we are made into jasmine, cinnamon and sugar. But we are onions, garlic, Ginger, roots, tough, essential, the basis of everything, indispensable. Too often we are made into the moon, a mere mimicry of another's light. But we are the sun, the blaze, the fiery depth. We are deadly and uncontainable. Take back your rivers, your stars, your flowers. We are the source, the light, the soil. I want to write as outside of beauty and myth, though. Outside secrecy, shame and marriage. Outside of songs, outside of heartache, outside of staring eyes or lowered gaze, I want to write us, even if I do not know how to begin, because at least that way will be a story for ourselves this time. Right. I just realised I didn't bring my phone up here, so I'm going to do two more poems. I think but I don't know what time it is. Or how to <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, as Rhys mentioned, I do, do love a bit of education. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> Guilty. Um, and, uh, uh, just wondering, I can't actually see anyone's hands, but raise your hands for yourselves anyway. Um, who in this room has heard of the prevent policy? Okay, about five people, mad, <laughs> right. Time to do some political education. Um, no, so for real though, the prevent policy, uh, if you haven't heard of it, 2015, became a law, a legal duty, upon every public sector worker in this country. So that's your teachers, that's your doctors, that's your nurses, that's your librarians, that's the police officers, that's the council, but that's public sector workers, right? That's a lot of people. Public duty upon them, legally they are bound to look for signs of radicalization amongst those in their charge, so you lot. Um, now, can you guess who they end up looking for those signs in? Yes, but also, yeah, but Muslims disproportionately, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And yeah, but the point there is, is, a, is a really important one, that children are disproportionately put onto the police database. So you might think, oh, a sign of radicalization, it's a good thing to look out for that. You get three-year-olds reported for, you know, drawing a cucumber that teacher hears as cooker bomb. You get, you know, t uh, you're, you've got kids from all, all levels of school. I won't, I won't bang on about this, but point is, this is, this is like huge levels of surveillance that we're seeing and the irony is that it affects all of us but actually because it's disproportionately affecting Muslims the apparatus can be built to harm us all and it's happening right under our noses and it's yeah mad so this poem is called PPP prevent it's because it's part yeah it's, it's, I'm not going into the title I don't know why I told you that <laughs> you cannot say that you're preventing terrorists if all that you're doing is preempting terrorists because in a political climate where terror is presupposed in Muslim people, your predictions are predicated purely on profiling. And this premise of profiling lacks scientific precision. It just takes perceived Muslimness as the prerequisite for violent decisions. So whilst preemption might sound like it makes political sense, in a legal system that purports to presume innocence, prevent is nothing more than prejudice. Because now a beard or a penchant for the wrong prophet or praying become proof of a predisposition to violence you're displaying. Yet the polemics of politicians who protest Muslim presence don't qualify as prevent-worthy practices requiring repentance. So what we're looking at is public policy prepared prior to evidence that even the psychologists have said is pseudoscience, a project that promotes the policing of Muslim people, placing pressure on the public sector to presume Muslim pupils and patients are prone to evil. You cannot say that you're preventing terrorists if all that you're doing is preempting terrorists. And to argue it's okay, because prevent also prevents far right extremists, is to lie that a system predicated on Islamophobic prejudice could possibly protect Muslims from a persecuting legislative. It is to lie that policy based in predictive policing could possibly be used to prevent itself. That providing further profit to an Islamophobic project is not just the most palpable manifestation of state persecution made publicly palatable through institutionalization. And let's not pretend, pretend, and let's not pretend prevent has no purpose either, because promoting the presumption that Muslims are prone to violence conveniently pretends that the state cannot be violent. 
No need to ponder the parameters that shape Muslim lives, no puzzling over foreign or domestic policy, arms trades, or racial profiling. C. Prevent perpetuates public policy participating in displacement, protecting the state and government from any pertinent debasement. No need to hold the political infrastructures accountable. Instead, the problem is Muslims, and the Muslim problem is insurmountable. Pretty convenient, no? You cannot say that you're preventing terrorists if all that you're doing is preempting terrorists. Perhaps if instead of prevent, we could ponder the past that made political violence probable, but imperialism loves to pretend itself away. So instead, police are given more powers as if policing protects the nation, and prisons and deportation planes are made methods of purgation. In the end, prevent is nothing but political deflection, proof that the state is headed in the most authoritarian direction. So prepare for permanent conditions of political persecution, because even if it's not yet palpable to you, the project of resistance is your obligation too. The project of resistance is your obligation too. Okay, thank you so much, guys. I'm going to end with a final poem. Um, I yeah, just want to say thank you so much um, for inviting me, um, Shirley and the whole team and all the organisers. It takes a lot of work to organise something like this, so yeah, massive thanks. And yeah, yeah, go on, yeah. Um, yeah, it's an honour to be here. There's obviously some amazing poets here tonight, um, so I'm, I'm hugely excited to see how this slam ends. Although there have been some controversy, I can't look down here because there's a bit of controversy, feeling a bit, uh, feeling a bit, uh. um, yeah, sorry, I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> I distracted myself, sorry. Yeah, uh, I have got some copies of my book, post Colonial Banter, with me if anybody would like them. I have a card reader, so you've got no excuses. Uh, yeah, <laughs> 10 pounds. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been Sahima Manzul Khan, and this is British Values, which is uh, part of the counter-extremism strategy in this country, and you may see if you ever walk into a high school or primary school that you have to be taught British Values, because they'll make you less violent. <clears throat> Young Muslims in Britain often straddle two worlds. They appear to have a foot in each culture concerns revealed around the national identification of Muslims in Britain. Review raises alarm over social integration and schools to, promote, pro schools to promote fundamental British values. The face of Britain is changing beyond recognition. I look in the mirror. It's not shattered, I am whole. No one for in, one for out. No reason I've got to learn Britishness from the somehow more devout. I'm not uneasy, torn, or straddling. It's not shattered, I am whole. Yet the opposite is somehow all that you'll get told. I mean, I guess, because if it wasn't, if we faced up to the glass, you'd be left with the fact that I am inside. I am Britain now. Because Britain is Bismillah. Britain is basmati rice. Britain is box braids and black barbers shops, Bollywood and Bungara. Britain is Bradford and Barking and Birmingham. Britain is biryani and black beans. Britain is, Britain is black. Britain is brown. Britain is boys blasting dubstep on the bus to town. Britain is body popping outside the tube. Britain is brick lane before it was cool. Britain is bilingual. Britain is the burqa. Britain is praying in the changing rooms. Britain has its feet in your sink. Britain is bad at knowing itself, belligerent and boring. Britain has not changed beyond recognition. Recognize it was never one thing. I am the inside you pretend is outside, but we have to stop pretending. Pretending the rolling hills are just romantic, not remnants of injustices swept under a rug. Like the tea didn't come from Asia, like its sugar wasn't grown by slaves, like dry humor isn't a way to just ridicule dissent, and cues don't expose the way we're always told to wait for change rather than making it. And it's funny that over-apologizing is seen as a national trait, because half of history is still waiting. I look in the mirror. It's not shattered, I am whole. There is no brink or turning point. I'm here. Britain is barbaric. Oh, sorry, did you think that was me? Barbaric bystander straddling the boundary. Not quite inside, so you could say I'm the things you forgot. Like you're modern, so I'm backwards. You're democratic, so you say I'm not. When the truth is, Britain is blood on its hands and back to the wall. Britain is selling weapons to the most repressive regimes in the world. Britain is the bombs the Saudis drop on Yemen. Britain is using fear to build surveillance apparatus since 9-11. Britain is believing in human rights whilst removing them all. Britain is Yarlswood, Brookhouse, Colnbrook and Morton Hall, immigration detention centres. 
Britain is 1,600 dead in or after police custody since 1990. And Britain has no qualms about detaining asylum seekers indefinitely. Britain is suicide attempts, secret courts and secret torture. Britain is stopping you at the border. Britain is seeing it, saying it, sorting it, which means Britain is also deporting it. Because what else do you do when you look in the mirror and find the sugar and tea had strings attached? The factories on the rolling hills depended on our labor. The bombs destroyed the homes of kids now at the border. Britain is barbaric. Britain is blindly patriotic. Britain is built on false narratives, slices of other people's dishes. Britain is stolen artifacts in museums named after itself. Britain is knife and fork polite, stabbing you at will. Britain is selective. Yours till it's not. In yours till it's not. Then blaming you. Britain is borders. Britain is Brexit. Britain is spending on weddings but not fireproofing homes. Britain is cutting mental health services, yet somehow strong and stable. Britain is 50% of young people in custody being from ethnic minority backgrounds, and Britain is blaming them for, for this statistic rather than asking difficult questions. Because Britain is blaming the kids who aren't white. Britain is blaming the immigrants. Britain is blaming Muslims. Britain is blaming bureaucracy. Britain is not listening. Britain is not that great. Britain is breaking, but breaking everywhere except the place it points the finger. Because there's only a few things left that are great about Britain. And there that Britain is bismillah, basmati and bilingual, box braids and black barbers, shops, Bollywood and bungara, body popping outside the tube, brick lane before it was cool. Britain is the broker. Britain is praying in the changing rooms. Britain has its feet in your sink. Britain is your greatest nightmare, every repercussion you never thought through. Britain is the terror to be counted. Britain is the mind to be got inside. I am the great in Britain now. And aren't you terrified?